which are in this brochure. If, if you don't have one, you can get one at the door. At noon tomorrow in the Pioneer Room, there will be two films about the changing lives of Arab women. The first one is called The Veiled Revolution, and the second one is The Price of Change. Then at 3 o'clock, our afternoon speaker, Maurice Zeitlin, will speak about people's movements in Latin America, and that will also be in the Pioneer Room. Then tomorrow night at 8, Nikki Ketty will speak about mass movements in the Muslim world and their third world implications of women and workers in Burma, Bolivia, Guatemala, and Mexico. She has written many books and articles on social change in Latin America and also has made a film about Bolivian miners. At present, she is on leave from the Department of Anthropology at the City College of New York, and she is doing field work in Massachusetts on the impact of deindustrialization. Her lecture tonight is on the changing international division of labor. It is my privilege to present Dr. June Nash. Thank you, Patty. I think the theme of cooperation and confrontation chosen for this conference reflects some of the tensions regarding world affairs. The growing integration of world production has indeed increased the opportunities for cooperation. At the same time, it has sharpened the conflict between nations and among sectors within nations that share unequally in the rewards of production. A decade ago, the model we were using for talking about the world system was that of dependency. The thesis was that the dependency of the so-called third world countries on first world countries, or as some call it, the periphery on the core industrial countries for technology, capital, and markets led to political, social, and cultural dependencies that undermine the autonomy of the um, third world countries and perpetuated the cycle of unequal exchange. The model emphasized nations as the have and have nots. Class conflict and gender were either ignored or treated with less concern. In the intervening decade, the integration of production on a world scale has changed the terms of the dialogue. As productive processes and whole industries have moved south of the border or to the Asian periphery, a new dialogue has commenced. The features of the economy associated with dependent third world or peripheral status are becoming endemic in core industrial centers. Unemployment, inflation, trade imbalances, and high interest rates are as expectable in New York as in La Paz or Cairo. In the last 10 years, the US has lost its primacy in high technology industries, auto, steel, electronics. Pockets of poverty have spread from the Ozarks and Appalachia to the Northeast and Midwest and are even beginning to show up in the high unemployment rates in Texas and California. Sectors of the labor force that are not competitive within a developed economy, such as those defined by gender or ethnicity, become competitive at the international level, whereas trade unions which grew out of and reflected the imperialist structure of which they were a part were able to limit entry into preferred occupations in the old industrial centers, they could not affect the allocation of jobs in the newly developing area. The secondary labor force, those who are temporarily employed in low-skilled and low-paid jobs, in the industrially advanced countries is harder hit by international trade than the primary labor force. That is, the skilled workers who are better paid more secure in their employment. 
since they are in direct competition. Gerhard Fels and other participants in a conference on trade in 1973 recognized as far back as then the need for a regional policy to help workers of, quote, peripheral regions of Germany and particularly female labor, which, he said, is less mobile on an interregional basis than men and is therefore more affected by the adjustment prices resulting from increased imports from low-wage, less developed countries in international competition. In the decade from the middle of the 60s, a major shift in investment policies took place as developing countries moved from industries that produce goods for internal consumption to industries providing components for export. The shift was provoked by changes in tariff laws, encouraging the rapid expansion of industries that produce labor-intensive assembly work, especially in garment and electronic manufacturers for reshipment back to industrial centers. These policies, called import substitution and export diversification, uh, the first and the second, that is, <coughs> are in fact complementary. It may well have been impossible to import or to introduce export diversification unless the earliest stage in import substitution had taken place and provided the infrastructure, managerial skills, and a disciplined labor force. Two periods of expansion of direct investment overseas since World War II have differed in their impact on the U.S. labor force. This first expansion in 1946 into the European market expanded opportunities and stimulated wage increases in the U.S. It was in an effort to get behind tariff barriers and not to take advantage of uh, wage differentials. After 1964, the expansion of investment overseas was quite different and into different areas. Went into Asia and Latin America and even into the Philippines and other countries more recently. It was stimulated by changes in the tariff law, but it was in the quest of cheaper labor. And the ultimate product was to go back to the core industrial countries, as they are called. It put first world labor in direct competition with low wages, and that's what I'm concerned with in the comparisons that I've been trying to make of the workers in Massachusetts with those that I've looked at in Latin America. The offshore industries, as they are called, hire female labor in the electronics and garments particularly, but now more recently in secretarial functions of a rather mass sort. When a job is exported overseas, uh, cheaper, unorganized female help can be recruited for the work done by experienced workers, often males, in the industrial centers. Ethnic and racial groups that are barred from jobs in the old industrial centers are able to enter into such jobs overseas, but at wages far below what is earned in organized shop shops. The competition between workers is abetted by technological change, and this has been pro pointed out by Froebel, Heinrichs, and Cray in their study of the International Division of Labor. The privileged position of the primary workforce is eroded without any gains going to the secondary labor force and service industries. At the same time, what can be called the tertiary workforce of government employees who were drawn in greater proportions from female and black professionals and clericals is eroded with the loss of a tax base. I shall examine the impact of the global integration of production on these sociological or socioeconomic processes in the United States, particularly in the Northeast in the past decade, and then go on to make these comparisons with Latin America. The processes as I see them are as follows. First, the growing dependence of workers on jobs in a shrinking industrial base has reduced the effectiveness of trade unions and other traditional working class community organizations. Second, the shift from production to service employment that has been a long-term trend in all major industrial countries has meant a decline in the proportion of the workforce organized. Since the trade unions failed to unionize the secondary labor force in the decades of prosperity, 
the increasing proportions employed in this sector of the labor force re weaken the position of organized labor. Thirdly, increasing numbers of women have been drawn into the labor force, first during periods of national mobilization and then as secular trends of the past two decades have exacerbated uh, the position of the family. There have been sh resulting shifts in the performance of nurturance functions within the families with a change in the division of labor. Fourth, the segmentation of labor market has continued and altered its nature, traditionally offering differential work opportunities to different racial and ethnic groups the segmentation of the labor market by sex has become more poignant as the participation of women in the labor force has become more essential for the economy at large as well as for that of the family. Fifth, as a result of these previously noted trends, many functions previously performed in the home have become the domain of agencies and professionals in both the public and private sector. Most recently, however, the new tax-cutting political climate threatens the attrition of many of these services in the public sector. Sixth, the, final, uh, the wider array of options available at two industries as they become integrated at national and international levels has reduced the need for corporations to respond to local interests. This has exacerbated the effects of the processes noted before, narrowing the tax base for local communities and restricting employments. So we see that the restructuring of industry in many uni uh, U.S. communities has occurred within the memory of octogenarians born at the turn of the century. Local firms that were owned and often operated uh, by inventors with a genius for organizing manufacturing establishments to produce the products they invented and find a market for them were financed by the 19th century industrialization in textile and food processing. This was the history of at least three firms in the electrical machinery industry that I've looked at in um, Massachusetts. The first of these was the Stanley Corporation, which attracted the attention of General Electric, which was recently formed in 1903 uh, when it purchased Stanley Corporation. Similar performances by other electrical machinery industry resulted in their incorporation in other larger plants. In a nearby town, near to that of Pittsfield, William Sprague's capacitor plant that he started in his backyard in Worcester in the 1920s grew into a mini multinational in its new headquarters in North Adams, where it moved in the 30s and eventually became incorporated with General Cable and more recently with Penn Central. It's opened up branches in the Philippines as well as in southern states and some Asian countries. The war and time clock in Ashland, started by an owner inventor, one of these um, geniuses uh, who, um, when he was given a task by his father at the age of 12 years of feeding the chickens in the morning, timed it so that he could electrically uh, give them their feeding without getting out of bed. Formed his own company, a company that was later taken over by GE in the 1930s, and then had half of its production moved to Ireland in the 60s finally was sold to Timex in the 70s. So right in a periphery of about 60 miles, I can see uh, the industrialization and the deindustrialization uh, going on in my own backyard. These plants experienced the growth that came with government investments in both world wars. The families and communities were expected to bear most of the trauma of contraction in the post-war years without much assistance from the federal government until the 60s. The industrial unions that were organized during the 30s restricted their role, limiting organizational drives to this primary workforce and their activities to wage negotiations. Most of the contracts negotiated in the post-World War II period contained more restrictions on the union than claims on the industry. The no-strike during contract pledge, for example, the definition of who was eligible for union membership, and even the issues that could be brought to a bargaining table were dictated by the company and written into the contract. Questions of the level of production to be maintained in the plant, the procedures in plant closing or contraction, the technological in innovations and how they would affect employment levels, 
all these were issues were explicitly ruled out in the contracts themselves. Issues affecting the infrastructure of services in transportation, childcare facilities for employed parents, or training of the internal labor force were never raised until very recently in the most recent contract negotiations this year. With the expansion of the industries into southern states with the right to work laws and overseas workers have experienced the weakening of their labor market position and corresponding weakening of the trade union organization. With chronic unemployment plaguing the regional economy, the corporations countered every threat of a strike with that of removing operations to other station, uh, states or overseas. In a recent strike, this was challenged, this threat was challenged by the, uh, the UE shop that was organized there, United Electrical Workers, and uh, the, NL, uh, the National Labor Relations Board settled in f favor of the union, which may become a precedent. Just as the trauma of change from a predominantly agricultural economy to an industrial society in the middle of the 19th century was worn by the family and community, so is the current deindustrialization being cast upon them. The diminishing support structures for these overburdened social units is in marked contrast to some of the European market economies and the socialized economies. I shall briefly review some of the recent trends in unemployment, the decline of social welfare, and the breakdown of redistributive processes. First of all, employment and unemployment, which everybody's talking about where I come from in Massachusetts. Chronic high unemployment rates are endemic in the US economy. Even in the decades of high prosperity from 1950 to 1970, the unemployment rate in the US exceeded 4.5%, double that of other developed industrial countries in those decades. After the recession of 1976, the national rates rose to 8.5%, with 9% of non-white and 11% of the workforce under 16. The impact of Reagan's economic policy has been to raise the overall rate to 10.4, and this morning's television said they envision uh, an 11% rate as soon as they get all the figures in for the next reading. This rising chronic unemployment exercises a, a constant depressing effect on the employed workforce. In regions with a high endemic rate of unemployment, we can read the impact in the falling wage rates. In, the new, in New England as a whole, manufacturing wages are 10% below national averages as of 1980. These low wage rates have attracted the kind of footloose garment and electronics industries that have been associated with offshore production in Asia and Latin America. Typically, these companies remain only as long as the tax incentives that attracted them and the wage subsidies in the form of CETA training programs are in effect. Lodged in the abandoned lofts of textile factories that left the North in the early decades of the 20th century, these companies pull out abruptly without paying any penalties. We were told by one company that simply hung a sign on their door advising workers coming in to work on Monday morning that they had gone to Jamaica. The instability of the economy vitiates any long-range planning by the community or the individuals faced with constant specter of unemployment. Brenner and more recently Paula Raymond and Bluestone traced the fluctuations in the national economy with changes in the rate of emissions in mental hospitals in child abuse and in other um, breakdowns, uh, indices of breakdowns of family life. The segmentary nature of the US labor force with buffers for the primary workforce protecting them from the direct adverse effects of economic fluctuations has in the past inhibited collective action. According to David Gordon, the increasing competition among the different sectors of the labor class has protected labor capital share from labor's demands. In the past, the existence of this secondary labor force has underwritten the preferred position of the primary labor force. Increasingly, women are going to work in the low-paid, unskilled jobs as men are being laid off from industrial plants. Most an analysts 
of the segmented job market treat the primary and labor force as though they were class groupings. In fact, members of the two segments often come home to dinner since the wife, relegated to the secondary labor force, is married to a member of the primary workforce and comes home to cook his dinner. The fact that they complement each other's position in the job market with the man's higher wages overcoming a sense of deprivation that a wage earner in the secondary labor force might otherwise feel, and the women's earnings, a safety net during layoffs, tends to mitigate class consciousness. The wage differential supports patriarchy in the home just as it underwrites it in the workplace. When a woman's earnings are consistently lower than those of her husband, the dual standard is preserved. What I have seen break it down faster than anything is when the women become active in trade unions or political action groups. During this strike at Greenfield that I mentioned, the electronic company plant, several women who rose from the ranks become leaders in the strike action, left their husbands as they became aware of the burdensome nature of subordination in the home when their husbands objected to their activities, although they tolerated their work roles. The family is called upon not only to absorb the shock of unemployment, but also to deploy labor resources to manage the stress of the overemployment of key wage earners. If the principal wage earner is able to earn more, he or she often takes on a second job to make up for the inflationary effects of the rising cost of living. The labor involved in social reproduction is then carried out by other members of the family, and this leaves the non-wage earning adult disadvantaged because of the lack of free uh, or fringe benefits, particularly pensions associated with household tasks. In contrast to European practices, in the US, they do not attach the responsibility for unemployment either to the firm or to the government except for the limited duration of benefits. Nor do over half of unemployed workers receive health care unless they are attached to a job. 28 million workers, or 45% surveyed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, did not receive protection, and 40% did in a study done in 1981. The unemployed often have no access to medical care. Whereas workers laid off in Europe and Japan feel a strong attachment to the job and most expect to and do get called back. In the US, workers are often not recalled. These practices have profound effects uh, on workers' attitudes toward and performance on jobs. The present recession has sharpened the dichotomy between the primary and secondary workforce since blacks, women, and youthful workers have been the first to be laid off. At the same time, the deindustrialization process itself is eliminating primary jobs in production. The senior worker in the primary workforce will probably not be able to find another job uh, after, particularly after middle age, whereas his wife or child still living at home may be able to pick up the temporary low-paying jobs in the service sector or informal workforce. Thus, while the segmentation of the job market is sharpened in this transition period, there are more and more people thrown into the secondary workforce. These changes may sharpen the class consciousness as a result you know, which has been played down. Because most of the workers in the export processing zones in Asia, the Mexican U.S. border, and Africa are women, their counterparts in developed industrial countries are the first to feel the effects of overseas competition. The gender division of labor imposes global competitive rates that are below minimal subsistence levels for the developing countries. This is also true uh, in the competition of robots where women and the secondary labor force is uh, more quickly affected than other sectors. The second point, the decline of social welfare has, brought along, uh, has been brought along with unemployment and the competitive pressures lowering wages <coughs> resulting from the international integration of production. This is a result both of the shrinkage in the tax base as production moves abroad as well as an erosion of fiscal responsibility as footloose manufacturers demand escalating tax breaks to enter or remain in the locality. Communities vie with each other to attract firms that may stay only so long as they receive these tax uh, rebates. 
In addition to the absolute loss of taxes with the movement of manufacturers abroad, those firms which remain in the U.S. are able to reduce their tax bills through accounting systems which defy the surveillance of the Internal Revenue Service. Nat Weinberg of the International Union of Auto, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America scores the imaginative accounting and the manipulation of transfer prices that enabled the multinational corporations to evade national taxes, control foreign exchanges, and deceive governments and unions on profits and earnings. The United Nations Committee on Transnationals has recognized the need for uniform accounting practices enforced on an international level, but as yet has not been able to establish such standards. Even before the Reagan administration accelerated the loss of tax revenues, programs for social welfare were hard hit by multinational corporation policies. The leading country in the export of capital, the United States has no national health insurance program, its social security system is constantly under threat of being reduced, public unemployment compensation is very low in comparison with other nations, and disability insurance is lacking except for the individual firms which have um, granted it. There are no national minimum vacation periods, and employer participation schemes are nearly lacking. The technological lead which enabled U.S. firms to maintain employee productivity at high levels and to justify wage increases has been lost, in part because of the lack of U.S. policy on technology. As a result, the U.S. has lost exports and suffers from a high imbalance of payments uh, which contributes to the devaluation of the dollar and rising inflation. The current policies are concerned with the reevaluation of the dollar but, uh, and decreasing inflation at the expense of even some of these um, other social policies. Elizabeth Jager, an economist for the AFL-CIO, berates the distortion of the U.S. economy ca caused by these multinationals selling technology at bargain basement prices. Far from attempting to overcome the distortions resulting from multinational invest investments abroad, the U.S. government has fostered them through a tax policy which permits taxes paid to foreign governments to be credited against the federal tax payment rather than being deducted as a cost of doing business. A tax deferral credit which provides that taxes on profits earned abroad may be put off until the profits are returned to the U.S., if, if ever and uh, uh, is figured to have lost to the U.S. Treasury $2.9 billion in 1966, $4.6 billion in 1970, and as yet the figures aren't even for what was lost in 1980. Sibaris and others emphasize the importance of intra-company transfers in such tax evasion. With state taxes ranging from 5 to 50 percent, the transnational company can reduce its final tax bill in countries with the lowest tax rate. In 1968, the tax bill of multinational corporations was $3 billion worldwide, with $2 billion going to foreign companies. Present losses with the tax benefits permitted by supply-side economics is incalculable. When U.S. firms go abroad, they pose a threat to social welfare provisions in the highly developed economies of Europe and Scandinavia. Hans Gunther notes that enterprise corporatism developed by the multinationals to attend to the social welfare needs of its employees has eroded national welfare policies in the European countries to which American firms have gone. These parallel structures are detrimental to the wider society since much of the population is left out of the agreements and the authority of the central government is weakened. Now, I'll just uh, briefly compare some of the trends that I've seen in the United States and in Latin America. First, with Latin America. Industrialization there in the post-World War II period has gone through two phases. The first of these was import substitution from about 1950 to 1965, and this provided, this was an attempt to make at home products which were bought from overseas. It did increase opportunities, particularly for men, and uh, it did, in the case of professionals, uh, provide entry into positions that were before then occupied by foreigners in the, uh, in the uh, Latin American countries. However, 
There was an extremely high cost for doing production in this way. Frequently, more had to be imported, even in, in uh, raw materials, to do the kind of production uh, that uh, these firms were undertaking. And so it increased the imbalances in payments between the US and uh, Latin America, and in that sense, increased their dependency. The export diversification reversed some of those patterns. Uh, that began roughly after the Tariff Act was passed in 64, and continues to the present. Although much of the activity in that kind of production was conducted in Asia, as transportation costs increased, they were done on, in the border area of Mexico. <coughs> Twin firms often uh, played a role, one in Texas, uh, one across the border in Mexico, in stimulating this new industry. The industries which have recently been studied by Pat Fernandez Kelly and others uh, employ 90% of the workforce is, uh, is women. And um, there is, as a result, a dramatic shift in the life expectations because the traditional role for women has in the past been uh, devoted to the family. At the same time, unemployment for men has increased, particularly on the border, where uh, the entry of um, farm labor has become more and more stringently prohibited. And you have a very distorted uh, relationship in the home and family uh, as a result of some of these uh, rapid shifts. The uneven economic development of multinational firms, his father might still be working on an old estate with some of the um, uh, paternalistic relationships still established between that workforce and uh, the um, owner, and the wife might be dealing in petty commodity um, production of craft goods for local or regional market. And so any kind of theory which doesn't deal with the increase in complexity of these coexisting modes of production isn't able to define some of the changes that are taking place in Latin America. As new industries, um, many of the um, larger firms are paying higher rates of pay than have been uh, given in the past, and uh, they can command the better or uh, more, um, uh, more educated workforce. At the same time, these industries can often forestall organization of trade unions and they typically are not being um, uh, organized in the um, new entry uh, firms. The p position of women at the same time that they are entering into productive work is threatened in the domestic settings. And uh, women as well as men are often forced to enter into the migration streams to uh, big cities in their own countries or across the border. While Mexicans may cross the border into the United States, the uh, Colombians are going to Venezuela where there are wage differentials that will attract them in addition to a differential in the um, exchange rate of their money so that wages, low wages earned in Venezuela can be turned into higher earnings when they return home. The uh, Haitians have moved not only into the Dominican Republic, where they are being used as very low-paid workers in some of, the mo uh, some of the industries that have moved out of Puerto Rico because the wage rate was getting too high. And at the same time, those who are not able to fit into the islands uh, have come in the boats to the United States in a desperate attempt to find employment or um, a way of life which avoids the repression of their own country. Reverse waves are occurring. Puerto Ricans are leaving New York at the same time that some of these new streams of newer migrants are entering. Migrant women who come into these uh, alien situations occupy the lowest paid jobs in those countries into which they enter. Recent study by Magalit Berlin about um, which is her thesis for Columbia University, is concerned with the Colombian women in Venezuelan garment trades 
which not uh, even um, Venezuelan women will enter because of the low pay and the kinds of um, conditions. Oftentimes, as women leave the subsistence-based rural economy, they lose the uncounted but often significant contributions they make to a domestic income in uh, production of food, in the crafts that they carry on there, and even in this, um, the development of herbal uh, remedies, a, a pharmacopoeia that is shrinking as uh, women are forced out of their uh, native uh, settings and lose um, the knowledge and the many gains that came from their control over that kind of, um, of medicine. Garment industries and other marginalized industries are often unable to compete uh, for capital. And so you have a reversal to cottage industries that has been described for Mexico, where capital resources have been absorbed by some of the new companies coming in and uh, the, um, the, the potential for maintaining these old declining garment firms or even textile firms is reduced. Jose Antonio Alonso has done a thesis um, concerned with these um, declining areas which have turned into cottage industry as garment is um, uh, farmed out to the, um, to the women in their homes. The mobility of all the workforce in Latin America has been accelerated and along with it, the instability, anxiety, and loss of security that is related to family and community ties. In North America, uh, the, um, the gap then between working people, North and South, may be lessening even while the gap at higher levels of professions and um, uh, in the elites has widened. Uh, there is the loss of production overseas, the consequent unemployment that I have stressed, every threat of a strike being met by a threat to leave, and as a result, an erosion of the gains that had been over made over the past century. Uh, the corporations have promoted the competition among the uh, towns and the states, both to reduce taxes and inhibit unions providing free services and welfare for corporations. Uh, the, the particular firm that I have looked at, which is General Electric, uh, was integrated internationally already in the 20s when it went to Canada and Latin America. The motives for those moves were principally to get behind any tariff barriers and um, uh, was not concerned at that time with uh, the um, attempt to get cheap labor, nor was the production shipped back to the United States. Sectors of the production uh, were also moved from the Northeast, uh, where the corporation made its uh, impact originally, to the South. Uh, the, um, the migration to other states within the, other, uh, within the United States of the workforce which is currently being displaced in these industrial centers has obscured the unemployment rates which in fact exist. General Electric dominated employment in the city that I'm uh, working in, in Pittsfield, throughout the 20th century, prevented other firms from coming in because they didn't want to have competitive um, uh, bids for labor pushing up the uh, wage rates there. Uh, as a result of the current attrition in production, uh, there is no longer an attempt to prevent other uh, corporations uh, from coming in, but perhaps the day is past when that sector of the um, country can make the kinds of um, appeals to industry. One of the things that I've noticed, uh, particularly in the changes in the sectorial distinctions in the workforce, is a lessening of ethnicity, the importance of ethnicity, both in defining the internal labor market, as it's called, and um, a much greater emphasis on gender, one of the processes I mentioned at the beginning of this paper. Uh, in the 20s, it was very hard for an Italian to get a job in Pittsfield. Uh, in, the 30, in the 40s, particularly after World War II, 
they did become a predominant force, both in the unions and uh, in the internal labor market, and controlled many of the distinct shops within uh, General Electric. That is no longer the case. Uh, frequent intermarriages between the different um, ethnic groups, uh, Italian, French, and Polish, has almost obliterated the particular distinctions that used to be made uh, in work as well as in um, residential group. At the same time, uh, the position of women in that labor market has been eroded because the kind of production that has been moved to the South earlier and overseas today is precisely what was done by women assembly line workers. And uh, so they play out the process also indicated in the beginning of this paper. The strength of community, nonetheless, in Pittsfield is outstanding. It is in part based on this ethnic cohesiveness and plays a role in the political and social uh, efforts of the community. New industry in plastics is, as a matter of fact, based on a strong Italian community which uh, re wished to remain in the city when that part of production was shut down uh, in the corporation, and they have succeeded in proliferating so that there are 20 or so viable and very strong um, plastics industries of very small scale, but committed to staying in the community and to employing uh, Pittsfield's young men. The growing, and women, because there is some assembly work. The growing industry in the area is tourism, and like many third world countries, uh, they are trying to attract uh, the dollars of uh, wealthy tourists from other parts of the United States or, and even the world. But these service jobs pay very little compared to heavy industry. And um, in fact, they're only about one third of what industry paid, just a notch above uh, the minimum wage. So the problems are all here displayed in this community. There is uneven development and a coexistence of a workforce making very different incomes and exacerbating some of the conflicts that exist um, among the workforce. There is a declining union enrollment so that um, any evening up of these wage differentials is unlikely. In a recent strike in uh, a garment company in town, uh, there was no movement whatever after a three month strike by the uh, women workers on the part of the uh, management. So as we look at some of these m marginal firms roosting in the abandoned textile firm, uh, plants that they have rented, um, we see women in the garment and plastic industries absorbing some of the newly released workforce, and we see an unemployed former preferred labor sector uh, fearful every day if they are employed that they will not see that tomorrow. Uh, the um, reliance on any of the uh, remaining paternalism or favoritism uh, that um, some of these marginal firms had produced is um, very unlikely in the future. Uh, it does, however, serve to make them resist unions and workers are as afraid of the union organizers coming because they, uh, uh, the insecurity is too great at this point. The, um, the resistance on the part of these workers who have lost their security in the job to welfare is uh, an impressive feature in um, the community which seems to have very deep cultural roots and uh, some of the changing welfare needs are being addressed particularly at women's centers which are trying to catch uh, people as um, women as they leave what they call the uh, displaced uh, homemaker syndrome and uh, avoid the implications for uh, that population of becoming a welfare uh, recipient. In conclusion, I'd like to try to sum up that the opposition of first and third worlds or center and periphery is inadequate to comprehend this changing seed. The stagnation and unemployment experienced in marginal areas of the developed center rival that found in the third world since the 60s. The distortion of the economy in the center as well as periphery has resulted in rampant inflation combined with stagnation 
rising corporate profits and falling real wages. A kind of welfare program for business through the tax re uh, deferrals, rebates, and even government loans to start plants in third world countries supports overseas investments while social welfare pro uh, programs within nations are in decline. The U.S. Um, military acts as a sales agent very often for the um, armaments and the police force to prevent workers organization in those other countries. The gap between rich and poor segments of the co population is widening along with the decline in redistribution programs. The concentration of resources, technology, and man manpower in key firms is reinforced in the 70s and in the 80s as trading on the free market has declined.